Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 96 of the Showbound Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Raskin, here as always with Ethan Cardwell. Cards, what's going on? Where are you coming from today? New new background. Yeah, no, I'm going to be playing like, um, I don't know what you call them, musical backgrounds for the next little bit. So uh, kind of all over the place. So I'm currently in my uh, grandparents' movie room upstairs. Okay, out in, in Whitby? Uh, that, well, these ones moved to Curtis, so Curtis okay. now, but yeah setting up shop and actually while well, i am kind of on that topic so um i was bored i was looking for a snack today so i'm just kind of trying to think of something like somewhat healthy as a snack right and so i put uh i saw this on tiktok and i put grapes in a bowl like dampen them with a little bit of water or whatever clean them off too and put a little bit of salt on top and then throw them in the uh, freezer for like 30 minutes and it was actually unreal have you ever tried that I tried. I didn't. I tried it without the salt. I tried just like frozen grapes once. I, I'm. There's a chance I might have talked about this like a long time ago on the podcast, but everyone was telling me like try frozen grapes. Like, but I didn't freeze them for thirty minutes. It was like hours, and I didn't like them. I think thirty minutes would be a lot better. Where they're just like a little crispy. They're not like it, get, it gets that little crunch to it. It's not like it. You don't want the middle to be like I don't know, like uh, hard. You know, you know, you like. Yeah, I, I think I gotta try that again. But and speaking of things to try. I tried barbecue sauce on eggs. It was yesterday morning. It's it's Tuesday night. I tried it Monday. Yeah, Monday morning. I tried barbecue sauce on eggs. And yeah, I wasn't bad. I, I'm not going to like put it in my morning routine. But yeah, like you get some credit. And, and I guess the listeners are, are on equally on your side as mine as it was like a 50-50 vote on the social yeah, media, which was That's baffling what I'm to me. People are on that. And like it's actually, yeah, because you, you – like you bash it thinking it's brutal, but like you got to try it. It's it's not bad at all. Even coming from a guy who said it would be the worst thing in the world. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just shocked that so many people are like voted for it. That that means they already tried it. Like they do it and they like it, which was even more yeah, surprising. It's, it's a show. It's an absolute clinic by the barbecue sauce on eggs. But I mean, let's stop talking about food. Let's get into the episode here. <laughs> well, I mean. What, what's been going on with you, like, another week? Um, are you back on the ice yet? Or, like, where are you at with your summer? Like, what's going on? So, I'm I'm going on the ice uh, Thursday, Friday this week. I just rented it out. So, uh, me and a few of the guys will just go out and skate to get my touches. Um, like, my body's feeling good and everything now. I've been into the, like, physio and stuff like that a few times. So, getting right back to 100% strength. And then, yeah, um, been in the gym uh every day you know this you know the routine and other than that a lot of golf so yeah sauna and then golf but uh no it's been it's been good so far i'm actually uh i'm going on a vacation um in a week or two or yeah not even two weeks in in like six days where where are you going uh punta cana oh everyone's going to punta cana now man i don't know man i i don't even know much like about like I've never really been over there since I've been like older because so biz, been so busy with hockey and stuff like that during the uh, winter months and stuff. So I'm not sure this is like my first uh, trip to like overseas like that, um, like tropical, I guess you could call it for like uh, maybe like seven years now. Well, OK, yeah. Big yeah trip it's been then. A while. So, yeah, I'm excited for it, though. Yeah, no, that'll be a good time. Um I mean, before we get into some hockey talk, I want to touch on our interview, our guest today, because um, this is an interview that I'm so excited to get out there. It's Cole Timken, as you can tell by the title, formerly known as the toughest guy in the OHL. Uh, he was a four-year London Knight, was an assistant captain there in London. He's coming off his best year at Brock University, where he plays now in U Sports and looking to go pro after. But what was cool about this interview to me, well, for one, uh, we did it in person. It was just, well, I guess, yeah. So it was just me. Cardi was in the middle of his playoffs. Couldn't couldn't get in on that one. Um, so Timmer and I did this at Archives Wine and Spirits, 39 James Street in Niagara, used coach showbound. Um, and we sat there over a couple, you know, glasses of wine, a couple beers or whatever. And we just sat there, no edits in the interview, just like free flowing, like a conversation, not one cut, not one edit, any of that. And we just like, sat there and and got to talk and i thought it was a really cool different style of interview with a different pace and a lot of stories which is cool and he's talking about how he you know got his reputation in the league and guys he 
you know, even unfortunately ended one player's career with a knockout. And we hear about all these stories and it was like, it was just really cool. And um, I'm excited for that one. And and he's a good guy and a good player. So it's going to be, uh, I'm ex- just excited to put this one out there, but um, Dude, he was like, I only played again. I think I only played against him once and it was like in my rookie year or something. Um, or maybe a few times. I'm not sure. Did he away? What did he, was he in OA? Yeah. For like half the season he was. Oh, okay. And then he went over to the Goge, right? Yeah. Okay. So I remember playing against him. Yeah. He was so scary, dude. Like guy would just like, when he was out there, like you knew just like, Hey, keep your head up. And then, and then he wouldn't like, he would give it to guys out there too. Like just wouldn't stop chirping and stuff. And like, everyone was scared shitless of him, obviously. Yeah. He, he ran his mouth and, and uh, he does the same thing at Brock. Like he's, he's nonstop talking, but it was funny. Like people, like people who have come to Brock who played against Timken in the O or whatever. And they're like, Oh, this guy ran my show in the O like, and he's such a good guy. <laughs> and so like, like there's so many stories of people um, about him, which is funny. And, but he's he, just like many of the tough guys. He's like a really good guy off the ice, like not mean or anything, you know, like it seems like most of them are kind of that way. Just like great guys off the ice, but you hate them and you're scared of them on the ice. Yeah. I don't really know any kind of guy who like lives up to the reputation on the ice, off the ice. I think, uh, I think all hockey players are kind of the same, man. Like, honestly, like all kind of have similar personalities and stuff like that and get along so well. It's just, you hate each other. And that's how similar you are that, uh, that you just, you both hate each other for the same reasons. And then you uh, meet up off the ice, you meet up at a uh, different team or something like that. And you realize, Hey, like this guy's not too bad after all, but (laughs) everyone's got to play the tough guy card out there. Yeah. Now, um, I guess some OHL news before you get into NHL. The Peterborough Peets now at this point OHL champions, winning in Game Six at home, which solidifies the Memorial Cup of uh, Kamloops, the host team, Seattle from the Dub, Quebec, and Peterborough. So, what are your thoughts, OHL player Ethan Cardwell, as the OHL season wraps up? What do you think? Yeah, I mean it hurts obviously uh, to see like an Eastern Conference team. Obviously, I'm excited that the East won it, but it also hurts at the same time because you you get to thinking, oh, what could have been and stuff like that. But uh, you can't dwell on it and stuff. But no, it's it's awesome for them, and um, obviously, big congrats to all those guys out there, especially the guys that I know well. And I think uh, what have we we had a few of the guys on the Pete's on the pod. So mm-hmm. what, what have we had Stillman. We had um, awesome. Austin. Um, uh, yeah, no, but come on the pod and look at that. Look what happens. But no, I'm not. Yeah. But it should be good, man. Like they had a good team all year. They kind of were off to a slow start. And I know we talked about it last week, but they're gelling at the right time. And obviously things are coming together. And it looked like they had a great parade and stuff like that. So again, good for them. They, they deserve it. They had a hell of a team and they lived up to the hype. Uh, and then. I don't know. I I want to get your prediction actually on uh, the member here. Who do you who do you got winning? So I obviously don't know as much about the other leagues as I do about Peter Rowe and the OHL, but from what I'm hearing, Seattle's an absolute wagon, man. Like I, a lot I of people, are, and they have so many first round picks on their team. So if I I mean if you're putting me on the spot to make a prediction, I'm gonna say Seattle. That's that's who I'm picking. Yeah, who do you think? I would I would agree with you there. Obviously, want the OHL to represent well and. It looks like all the leagues are pretty good, though. Quebec, obviously, coached by uh, Patrick Waugh, and they have a solid team there. Pete's, obviously, we know a ton about. They're peaking at the right time. Seattle, Wagon, from what I've heard, and Cam Loops is no slouch either. They really loaded up at the mm-hmm. deadline as well, so it should be great. I mean, every every year that team who's in it is competitive anyway, but this year it seems like they're uh, they're definitely a threat. Yeah, I think they made it to the conference final, too, and went, so they went deep in the playoffs. I, yeah, I, I think you're right, yeah. So they're yeah they're no they lost to, I think they lost to Seattle actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it should be a good tournament. I'm pumped, man. It's always fun to watch. And I just w- one thought, one question for you about the OHL final there. And I know like with Brett Brochu being injured for London, and there was some goalie questions. We talked about it like a couple episodes ago. Like Dale Hunter makes the call to go switch goalies facing elimination and, and put in Wilmore. Um, did you see that? And like, what do you think of that as from like a coaching perspective? Like that's a gutsy call on it. And it, he was great. He was a great goalie. Yeah, he played well. Um, I mean, I, I guess you got to go. I, I've never coached before. And 
it'll be interesting one day maybe you do coach and stuff and you you do it your own way so it's it's interesting like obviously he's had so much success in the league so nobody can even bat an eye at his decisions and and stuff like that so <clears throat> but I, I I don't mind it like I mean if you if you have full confidence and full trust in that goaltender and then your team to back it up um then yeah maybe you do need to shake things up Nate maybe you need the the guys to feel a little bit more desperate out there I'm not sure if that was what he was looking for or whatever but um yeah no like obviously this tis, the decision paid off well in uh game five was it and then he played great in game six as well just kind of came out on the wrong end of it that night and London couldn't put any more past Simpson who obviously played really well too winning the MVP but it anytime you don't have your starting goalie it's gonna hurt yeah and that's what I said about our our predictions a couple episodes ago um you did say that. and we we both said or you didn't pick I said Peterborough in seven uh obviously Peterborough got it in six so let's chalk one up for for the showbound predictions here um there you go now and we'll get into some NHL stuff quick like I mean, it's three nothing Florida right now in that series, and it's uh, right. Vegas and Dallas go tonight. But it's two nothing Vegas as we record. I mean, just like Florida, <laughs> like if they can get the sweep and get the rest, I think they're not. No one's touching them. I don't know. That's another team coming into their own, and like it's insane to see what they're doing there. Um, they're just steamrolling teams, like just going through them with no issues here. So. They've got it in cruise control the last two rounds here uh, since since they took over that Boston series. But Kachuk is unbelievable, and Bobrovsky's pay, like playing up to his pay right now. I mean, there's no arguments about that contract, the way he's playing right now. If, if he can go out there and get them the cup, everyone will be like so happy that they had him and, and stop bashing him all year and stuff, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely right. If, if he... I mean, people are already saying now he's lived up to his contract and they haven't uh, gotten out of the, the the conference yet, but he looks unbelievable. He looks like he's not going to be stopped and he's just a beast. So, yeah, I think if, if they win this cup, like he's earned every every penny, man. At, at the end of the day, like you sign a guy like that to win and uh, if he can deliver, then then good for him. He earned it. So because uh, he was taking a lot of heat. But what do you think about? Well, I guess. OK. Is there is there a chance for Carolina here? I think I think Carolina, I don't know. It's kind of hard when you're down in Rio to even say they have a chance. But, I mean, you're, no one's really ever out of it at this point. Like, well, that's what you said in the Leaf series, too. And you started, quote-unquote, you started beliefing. <laughs> and yeah. um, it's never, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. Because if I was down 3-0, I would say that there's a chance, too. But, um I don't see this one turning around, not the way that the Florida's playing. Like they haven't showed any like sort of like yeah, slow, I know you're right. Slowed down at all. They've they've only picked it up as the playoffs have went on and that starts with a historic first round and beating the Leafs, putting their team into a huge panic. And now they're absolutely dominating the team everyone thought was the wagon coming out of the East. Do you think Florida's like talking about this in the room? It's like we should probably ask this to Dolphs when we have him on. But like th- what they did to the Leafs and what's happening with the Leafs now, you think they're just sitting there laughing? Like, look what we did, boys! Like, look at this. I don't know, man. But they they literally can't stop winning, and they're on an absolute tear, and they're taking out people left and right and stuff. So, um, obviously, what they did to Boston, crazy as well. So, there. Well, that's definitely a question to be asked for Dolphs. Yeah, and. uh I mean, I saw someone saying like, "Oh, if Carolina loses, do you blow it up? Do you blow? Why do fan bases keep panicking? Like they're in the third round right now, they're and they're missing two top players. Like, don't blow it up. They're good. All you got to do is retool a little bit if you don't make it. But like, Carolina's a good team and they've been good for a while. Like, I don't know why people start panicking like crazy. What do you think? No, it doesn't make too much sense. Like, I don't, I don't see any reason to panic, especially if they're you're the Carolina Hurricanes because they they play with grit. They just ran into some. Uh, tough uh, situation yeah i mean you get to the third round like you don't blow it up that's not easy to do um anyway i mean yeah quickly on the leafs like we we talk about it quickly i, I guess not really much to say everyone kind of knows what happened but i just hope it works out for the leafs that's all i just hope the boys I stay i hope I, I hope we get a gm that keeps all the guys and and we run it back and and win the cup next year leafs 2024 stanley cup champions 
such a bold take. I mean, we'll, we'll let it be. We'll come back in a year. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, is there anything you want to say now before we send it to the interview? A- after the interview, we're going to talk some golf. We got, we got a lot to talk about on the golf end, but anything you want to go now? I think we're good. Let's send it over to Cole Timken now. All righty. We're pleased to be joined by Cole Timken in person here live at Archives Wine and Spirits in downtown St. Catharines. So um, a bit of a change of pace on this interview for the listeners who aren't watching. If you're if you're listening, we're we're live at Archives where we're going to we're going to have a couple glass of wine, maybe a couple beers just shoot the shit. Timken, my a friend of mine, and we live in the same city here. So we, we had to do this one in person. So um, it's going to be interesting. So, Timmer, how you doing, man? Good. Just got off of a kind of a good day of golf, I'd say. I shot one of my lower scores that I have in a long time, so that was good. And I'm, I'm starting work in like the next week. I just got done my last exam actually this morning, so I'm just sitting back for another week, and then I'm going to start work and start the summer grind. Yeah. So I'll give a little background on on Timmer here. So uh, you're from Rainy River. Ontario so we'll, we'll get into that a lot more about Timmer's upbringing because that's one of the reasons like the biggest reason I wanted to have him on because his his story is incredible but um, a town of what seven eight hundred people yeah pushing like 900 maybe yeah that's three hours away from Thunder Bay like in the middle of nowhere and um, Timmer ended up playing in the OHL for the London Knights where he was an assistant captain and now uh, he talks about school he's here at Brock University playing for the Badgers um, and uh NHL camp along the way and we'll get into all this stuff but but uh so yeah we talk, we're talking golf timber like you said and I heard I don't even know if I want to bring this up but I'll so, bring it up so last week you got kicked off the course yeah. and, <laughs> what happened it was kind of bullshit the way, like I mean I can't put 25 percent of the blame on Rochi <laughs> just just because we were playing piss a cart like our tournament that we do with the team and he's sitting in the car with me. I'm driving. And we're going to go pick up my ball and go shoot, like, the best shot, which wasn't one of ours, obviously. So I'm going driving to the car, driving to the ball. And third time this afternoon, Rochi's hat flies off. So we make a big, big deal of it. Catch his hat, right? And then I look back. We grab it. And I look up, and there's trees right in front of me. And it's not like we were going super fast. Like, we were driving pretty responsible all day, I'd say. Like, we weren't that. We were <laughs> that drunk. And then I look up. There's trees right here. We, we hit it. It was fine. We go in reverse. We go three holes later. And then a member ratted us out, pulled the clubhouse. Guy drives up. This friggin' bald looking pit bull guy came out all pissed off. Act like we murdered somebody. And then, yeah, didn't even give us a chance to explain. I got charged like 55 bucks. There was no damage at all. Oh, really? $55 of that. We couldn't even finish our route. We're like 14th hole. But yeah, that's kind of luck I get on the course sometimes. Oh, that's funny, man. Yeah, yeah, here, I'll, I'll pour us a, a glass of water yeah. here while we wait to get, get some drinks going. So am I. Yeah, I'm. I'm excited. This is a, a cool setup for an interview. We've actually never done an interview like like this. I guess where I mean the listeners heard like people just walked by us and stuff. We're we're just chilling at the the bar area of archives here. So fooling. Whatever happens, we're gonna go with it. No cuts. This interview, no edits. We're just going. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about like I mentioned your your upbringing. So Rainy River, pushing 900 people population, made it to the London Knights. Like I said, so um. Timmer also, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be jumping back and forth, but Timmer has a reputation. This guy is known as the toughest guy in the OHL. Yeah, yeah, I don't care. I mean, I, I can say it. You don't have to say it. I'll say it. You'd fight anybody. You'd chirp anybody. Um, so going back, even before we get into all that stuff, what was your hometown like? Like, I want to know about your upbringing. What was that like growing up in Rainy River? It was it was a really small community. Like our town was so small where when you start like youth hockey, you have to go across the border was right on the border of Minnesota and the town in Minnesota is not, not much bigger than Rainy River, but wow. roughly, roughly about like, I don't know, maybe 1500 to 2000 people. And so we got the benefit of going across there and like playing Minnesota hockey. Nice. So I, I played there until I was 10 years old, but I was always like jumping up like a division just because of hockey wasn't that good. And I was kind of excelling at an early age. Yeah. So I, I ended up just jumping divisions and then my, we moved uh, to Fort Francis, which was an hour away, which was like another hour closer to Thunder Bay and ended up playing double A hockey there when I was 10 and then had a really good year. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't realize I was one of the better kids in Fort Francis. Cause looking at, Fort Francis from Rainy River, you're like, oh, what a big town. Yeah. A big town of 8,000 people. It's like what I look like, what I looked at like when I was 18 to like London, I'm like, oh, big thing. That's what I looked at Fort Francis. But yeah, I, I, uh, like I excelled 
a lot when I was younger, more or less because I had like a lot of size, but I was skilled too. Like I could put the puck in the net kind of thing. But yeah, well, I went from Rainy River right to Fort Francis and then started my double A career from there. And kind of just, yeah, and just kept jumping, kept off jumping, and... just playing, playing my style of hockey and things kind of worked out. So even like growing up in Rainy River and in Fort Francis, what do you guys do for fun? Like maybe outside of hockey, what is there to do? Like, yeah. I'm sorry if that comes No, no, me. it's not. It's yeah. it's an honest question because like there isn't a whole lot to do. I will take a time out. Yeah. What's up? Something to drink, Chance? I'll take, um, can I get a glass of that sparkling wine that you're serving up front there? Absolutely. I'll take your finest yeah. beer. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so what did you guys do for fun and stuff? Like, I mean, I didn't honestly – it's a great question because I didn't start golf until COVID. So like actually growing up and stuff like in the summer, I mean, if you're not training, I guess for the next hockey season, there's not really a whole lot to do. If you don't golf in a way, you have to like find stuff to do. Me and my family like camped a lot. So we would go for the odd week and just go camp and chill nice. that way. But yeah, hell, I mean, you'd have to go on the lake. You have to go do like, you have to go. And I, we, we didn't really grow up big fishermen or big hunters, which is kind of crazy because we live so Northern, but we, uh, we did a lot of, camping and just like go on the lake with our family friends and stuff like that but realistically like you can't just go hit a golf simulator even though it's the middle of summer you can't just go do simple things that you go do in st Catharines or toronto or yeah it's tough <laughs> so it's, i mean i know you're older now but does st Catharines feel like a big city to you it does honestly like being being so north i didn't even know st Catharines was a city like yeah. i knew like, i feel like a lot of people kind of like st Catharines is a hidden city in a way because it's right next to niagara but i I had no clue, but yeah, to answer your question, like, it's nice being, like, living in London was a big thing, but it, it was so yeah. big, and I was so young where it almost didn't feel real, where, mm -hmm. like, now that I'm actually, like, living here and have a car and, like, all that stuff, it does feel, like, a little too surreal. <laughs> yeah, and and we will get into the London stuff for, for the listeners, getting excited to hear about that. It's always good to have a London guy, but um, even just back with Rainy River and stuff, I'm curious. I have so many questions about this, but in your class, like, in school, how many people were in your class? Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank the you. Muskoka cream ale and the Fred Wines from Rose Sparkle. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So hey, cheers, Tim. Cheers, bro. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, how many people were like in your in your class in school? This funny story. So I started my preschool in Rainy River, and in my JK like SK classes, we had maybe I want to say roughly like eighteen, maybe twenty kids in our class. But it gets funny because my education throughout my years to from like jk to grade eight was all over the place from like rainy river to fort francis there was like a little town in between called stratton and my mom worked there and that was only 15 minutes away from rainy river but this was like such a small school bro i'm not even kidding there was at one point in the school 60 63 kids 63 kids in the whole school from jk to grade eight wow. and i went to this school for two years just because my mom worked there and like i kind of wanted to get out of the school i was in just just whatever it was a little easier to be in this school of 68 compared to 400 kids or whatever but yeah it was there's only one school too right like it's not like you have other options like if you're going to high school in rainy river there's the one high school and if you're going to high school in fort francis there's a one high school yeah. like, there's no options outside of what you got there but yeah literally classes i've had classes as small as 10 classes okay. as big as like maybe 20 ish <laughs> okay there you go yeah not terrible, um, but. what about in rainy river if you're really sick or like, is there a hospital? Yeah, no, there's, okay. there's medical care there and stuff. It's not great. Like even in Fort Francis, which is only an hour away, like that's where they'll send you. If you're okay, like, yeah. if they don't have the equipment for Rainy River, then you go to Fort Francis. But yeah, nothing's, everything's pretty scarce. <laughs> Rainy River as okay. far as. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating like, to me. To, to add to that too, there's, there was, honestly, it just burnt down. There used to be one restaurant that was running. There's, I don't even think there's a restaurant that's like still like running. There's like little, there's like, trucks like little chip trucks and stuff but there's not a lot going on as far as industries <laughs> it's really crazy to me man and mm -hmm. so you you moved did you move to uh thunder bay ever or did you like commute from I, fort francis no or? so i so when i was 15 when i was living in fort francis so like i moved to fort francis when i was 10 years old and then played on my double a career and i was going to go to thunder bay when i was 14 like move there to go bill it and play like thunder bay kings like the triple a yeah that's your only outlet really you could go play triple a in a which is like close to the Manitoba border and you go play Kenora Thistles there, which is like kind of equivalent to Kings, but it's like really not. That's more if you want to go like Western route, but I was always like had my eyes on the OHL. So yeah. I was like looking the quickest route to like go where I wanted to be. So yeah. Uh, 
like played my five years in Fort Francis. And then I was like 14. And I was like on the midst of going a year before my draft year, but I didn't want my parents to spend $35,000 on a year that I wasn't even going to get drafted on. And I knew if I went back home, mm -hmm. I was going to make the high school team. Yeah. My grade nine year, like our, our high school program is always like the best out of like our little shitty area. So, yeah. so I was like, whatever, it's going to be a challenge for me to, to actually make this team and like play with guys who are 18, 19 years old. And I'm only 14, 15. But I, I came back, decided not to play Thunder Bay that year. And then when I was 15, I was like, okay, I'm going to take off here. Because I knew that was – and my whole family told me, my uncles were like, Colt. Because I was scared to go away. Like, it's not an easy step, right? Yeah, like, that I'm pretty sure I sure. – Exactly. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I just got, like, a new girlfriend and stuff. So that was yeah. biting at my tail. <laughs> so I, I really just, like – I was homesick. I remember when I did move to Thunder Bay. And I was like – I remember I almost came home after two weeks. Like, I was so done with it. I liked all the guys and stuff. I just couldn't do it. I was just like – Yeah. I was so, like – so much anxiety, all this stuff, right? So – I remember I called my dad. I'm like, I'm back in my bag. I'm coming home. Like, I really just, I can't do it. And he's like, bud, just give her a week. Like, give her like seven days. He's like, call me after. And if you want to come home still, you can come home. And then obviously a lot of support from my coaches and stuff. But mm -hmm. ended up like making the right decision because I was, I already had my bags back. But I'm happy I stayed because wow. that's what on it, like really got me drafted to go to London. Yeah. And all that. Well, like a lot of, like we hear it from everyone we have on the podcast. Like, you know, typically guys move away at 16, call it to play junior or whatever. And, and you moved away a year younger than that, but even 16 as it is, is, is young. And people just kind of forget that because like for myself, I moved away at, at 17 or almost 18 to go to school as most non-hockey players yeah. kind of do. And that's like, I'm, I'm ready at that age, but like three, four years younger than that, moving away from home, people kind of forget like your most kids aren't really ready yeah. to do that. And you had to in your situation. And so um, can you talk about the OHL draft for you? Like how it, how it went like did you did you know you were gonna be a pick like just all the OHL draft stuff yeah so like after I did get drafted I I didn't end up like going I went to London camp my 16 year old year right and I did that's the year they won the Mem Cup with Marner and Dvorak and all those studs mm -hmm. so I like kind of knew going into it Robert Thomas was a pick ahead of me Evan Bouchard like Finn yeah. Evans all these other guys and I'm like there's no way I'm making this team as a 16 year old year so I and you were a fifth round pick by yeah, the way for those yeah we haven't mentioned a fifth round pick to London so yeah go so ahead. fifth round pick and Ended up coming back home and playing junior because, like, again, our junior team was one of the better teams in like the whole area. And we, this was this was a, the, the Fort Francis Lakers yeah, and the okay. SIJHL, and you guys won too. Yeah, right? we won that but year. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I had a good, I had a good season. I, I was rookie of the year, point I, per game guy, right? Yeah, I was. I, I just under, I think, but I got okay. suspended the last two games against the worst team in the league. Oh, so I probably would have got it, but I got wow. screwed. I, I remember actually my first game. This is a good, good, good way to start my junior career. It was hilarious. So. Right before I went to London, uh, we had this junior game. Sorry, not this junior game, this exhibition game that we. It wasn't like a, against a team in our junior league. It was against a, a team in the uh, in the uh, MJ, like in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. It was the Steinback yeah. Pistons. And I was 16 years old. I have already posted this on Twitter because I was so pumped. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cringy. I think I still have it on there. But I nailed this guy at the end of the game. I didn't really get too many shifts, like just because the coach was feeling me out to start. Yeah. And I nail this guy chipping out of his zone. I crush him on, on like the boards and I skate away like all cocky, slash me in the back of the legs. I turn around, I drop them. I ended up like doing pretty well. Like hit him a couple of times. Didn't really know what I was doing, just yeah. kind of instincts. Was that your first fight? That was my first fight. Apparently, okay. it was a 20 bomb. <laughs> oh. A 20 year old loser that like everyone knew on our team, like just from whatever playing junior hockey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They all chirping the shit out of them on the way out and stuff. But, oh my God. So yeah. yeah. So then I, I went to London Cap after that, didn't make it. Played my year. In Fort Francis, rookie of the year, like played well, fought like five times that season, like was playing first line at like for the last half of the season. And we we won our we didn't do well like the Dudley Hewitt or any of that, yeah. but like we still made a little mark. But yeah, going into the draft, like I I like I don't know, I didn't know if London was really keeping up as far as like where I was playing because I wanted to get a junior card right in London mm -hmm. and I wanted to like be there. So because like Alex Formanton, right? Yeah, like, he was the same draft as me, but he was 11th round. He's my really good buddy too, but like I, I was just so like dumbfounded almost when I was like, oh, how's this guy like watching every single Mem Cup game? Like he was eleventh round pick, like didn't play this year kind of thing. And then I was like, oh, what? and then play with him the next season. I'm like, this kid's a fucking second round pick to the NHL. Like he's yeah. Really but I was just like, how the hell did they see that? Like kid, they draft a kid at five nine, and then one year later he's six foot two, oh, and he's yeah. putting up thirty goals in his first year, but. Yeah, sorry. Get back on no, it's good. I mean, we love that here, man. Get back on topic. Uh, yeah, so I didn't know if they were really tracking how things were going in the port, but I knew, like, 
they would have had to hear a little bit. We have video too, which is kind of hard to believe. Yeah. And yeah, did, did, did okay. Got rookie of the year, like all that stuff. And I go to camp the next season and actually had a really good camp, like worked really hard that summer, which is kind of hard to believe, but I, I, had, a, <laughs> I had a personal trainer. I didn't golf yet. So I was buzzing all summer and uh, yeah, I ended up just making the team. I made it as a fourth liner. I was kind of on the bubble, like for the most of the season, I was, I played 45 games, but I was just kind of trying to get my feet wet, even though it was my draft year, which was kind of a big season, but like, yeah. it's tough walking onto that London night team, especially right after a mem cup year. And like, you got guys like Max Jones and Ole Levy and Cliff Poo and Victor Mette. Yeah. And you're just trying to like, play just so many good that's guys. That's what I there. mean. Like, yeah, we like, had Max Jones on this podcast, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Jones is a funny guy. Yeah, he's awesome. his buddy. We had some funny nights. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. it was, it was always, always fucking fun with those guys and the teams they were just like i mean each year you got more comfortable so i don't think i looked at like like i wasn't so star struck i guess as um, as more of you went on obviously but going into that first year when i was 17 i was just like holy shit how the, i was literally just thinking how the hell did i make this team <laughs> like that's all it was but yeah. there was no, no grit really like on the team we got carbonara later but there wasn't yeah, like that guy's a lunatic. Yeah, he's crazy. <laughs> but he's the one that taught me like a lot about like fighting and grabbing and like how to actually position yeah. yourself to not get the shit kicked out of you. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was it was a little uh a little scary going in, but I got comfortable. Cliff was unbelievable to me and so many other like Victor was great too. And Dale Dale was the best because I he's the one that kind of put the confidence into me to like know that even if I'm not going out there and but not even care about putting up points. I never really did. But even if I am, well, getting, you did. We'll get. We you did have a almost yeah. fifty point season almost. there, forty nine or something. So, but yeah, go keep going. Just just with Dale, though, he always just was like liked my game. So I never like felt the pressure to feel like I had to put myself in a position to like get a turnover and they get scored on instead of me getting a point. He just yeah. wanted me to play my game, and that's why I feel like I stuck around for so long. And it's funny, like, I've heard it go both ways with Dale, and maybe it's just, like, if he likes you or if he doesn't. And I, like, I know someone on the team this year who ended up getting dealt, and he was a first-round pick, and, you know, maybe Dale and him didn't, didn't get off the right foot, but you you and him had a great relationship from what I understand. Yeah, right? like, he definitely had a couple of opportunities to, like, kind of shoo me out the door if he wanted to. And he gave me the chances to like, kind of, I don't know, I guess like he just gave me second chances, which I probably didn't even deserve, but he was, he was more than great to me. And I, I don't know, like I seen, I seen first rounders, like you're talking about, like I'm not going to name names of this one person yeah. in particular. <laughs> and he came in and he was like, a, I don't know, I'm not going to say what pick he was, but anyways, came in, wasn't getting the ice time that he wanted. I remember hearing him sit at the front of the bus like right behind Dale go on about like oh talking to his agent like oh I'm not fucking I'm not playing <laughs> I'm not playing any minutes blah 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 going on and like I seen I seen like Luke Evangelista for example like seen him come in keep his mouth shut does a play a shift the first season at all and then look at him now playing in the NHL yeah you know what I mean like there I don't know he he's not a very personable coach like he he doesn't like really talk to you that much one-on-one where like you're going to get something out of them that you like you want to hear yeah. it's going to come from like the staff above them it's going to come from mark if mark i'm pretty sure mark's still there as their GM. yeah so it's going to come from mark like mark's the guy that steps down and kind of tells you how it is really oh yeah that's oh, kind yeah. of an interesting uh, it's a weird dynamic but yeah. it works if if you take it the right way yeah as soon as you try to battle it oh it's it's game over not game over for you but like <laughs> you, you you have it rough you yeah. have to kind of just comply like that's the ohl for you too in a nutshell like I always said that to Billy Bosco. I go, and in that shell, I was like, we're kind of robots. I was like, we get paid two thirty five every two weeks. What does that average out to? Eighteen dollars a day. <laughs> That's what it does. It's eight, we did the math. There you go. Eighteen dollars a day. I was like, it, I mean, you, you do have a great life, right? They get the bills paid for and all that stuff. But like, yeah, going back to that Mark and Dale dynamic, it was, it was like interesting. And I seen guys take it both ways, where like it benefits you, benefited me without me even really like realizing it. And I'm yeah. thankful for that. But like. There's guys that just get screwed just based off of being a cutthroat business. And like yeah. talking with Tyler Rolo and like yeah. on also on the Badgers with me and Rask here, like Rolo, we always said the same thing whenever anyone's like asking about like the management, like it's literally a business. Like yeah. when I, when I got the snip in my OA year, I didn't like, I kind of, kind of knew something was going on after I, I got like a six game suspension. Second oh. time I mentioned a suspension, but yeah, I got a six game suspension right before I got cut. But like, 
I only, I didn't even have half the points I did the year before at that point. And it being in my OA year when they're pushing to go through yeah. that cup, I'm like, oh, they got they got guys they're bringing in, but it wasn't even like they they didn't have a team for me. They didn't they didn't really like, care to like. I felt like they did care to look for one, but it was so tight with all the teams. They all had their their own ragers and all that. But yeah. I was I was sitting on 199 games. <laughs> that's oh, what I finished. No that's, what I, that's what I finished my only. Wow. That's what I finished. Wait, my, I love an only. I know. I know. So. I also I like to mention this that if I didn't get suspended for I think it was 22 to 24 games in total oh, for my three and a half years, then I would have had like 100 or 220. Yeah, <laughs> but there. but whatever. It's just and so they didn't find anything for there, and that's that's when I went to Caledonia and just kind of took the junior money and. And then oh, yeah. met Bernie and met Hughesy and yeah. met all the guys. And you guys were all getting paid big oh, there. God. It was it was ridiculous. And like I feel bad for the guys on London because that was a COVID year, right? Yeah. And they were so hot in the playoffs. Like they were yeah, playing. They were good Billy, team. Billy was still on there, so I was keeping yeah. it like I was still was good friends with all the guys on the team. But like me and Billy were talking close, and they were just like we're buzzing. Like I think we could actually win this whole thing. And then two days later, everything's toast. Yeah, like, crazy yeah. man. So I mean, well, and we'll we'll get into it a, li- a little more too. But I'm curious, just going back about fighting and stuff. So you know, you told the story of your first fight there, but when did you know like fighting was gonna have to be a part of your identity and a part of your well, game? I'd say I'd say even bef- like my honestly my grade nine year of uh, playing. No, honestly, my first year of that, honestly when I could hit. <laughs> like, I, I'm trying to think back and like each year I just remember like always being the aggressor. So you were always a tough guy. Always, yeah. Like Bantam, yeah. Bantam first year. Which was like the first? No, sorry, sorry. Pee Wee first year. I remember back in the day, like you could actually hit Pee Wee's. I think it's now it's Bantams. But when I first started in Pee Wee, I was a bigger, stockier kid. I think I was about five nine almost when I was when I was about whenever Pee Wee first year is twelve years old. Yeah. But oh, I was bad. Like I was hurting kids and like getting the head checks every single call, even though they weren't. They just had to call something. Yeah, like, he's bigger but, and tougher. And then progressing on, like once I got into like grade nine muskies, and you get into those little like altercations not even altercation like little scraps and shit mm. and i was doing it against grade 12s and i'm like holy fuck i was like i'm manhandling this kid yeah like, i remember one time at a branded tournament uh when we were in uh manitoba i literally i nailed a guy and it was kind of like after a whistle kind of thing i smoked him the kid skated up to me this huge fucker and i literally just picked him up and chucked them i'm like what the fuck <laughs> i was like why did i just do that i got kicked out of the game oh. I, was like, I didn't really matter at that point but i was just like I was like, I think I'm a little bit, just a little bit stronger than most people that I'm dealing with. Like, obviously I meet my maker here and there and I, I will get thrown around, but for the most part, like, I don't know, I'm usually not scared of anyone. Just things don't go my way. But <laughs> You're definitely not scared of anyone. No, no. Man, I, you, you have a lot of fans here because including me, like w- watching you play is so entertaining with, I mean, there's a couple clips I'd send them to you and stuff. You're just wrecking people um in this league and and you know it's not junior anymore there's men yeah. in this league big guys playing pro um like i mean going on to play pro and stuff and and you had a couple big ones this year so yeah. um including remember that one on og oh, oh <laughs> yeah against U of T and open ice just rocked him and um just a couple of good memories of hits but even uh sticking with the london stuff so uh what was life like no no need to go too much in detail but life like off the ice as a member of the london knights it was it was sweet. Like I think people make it out to be like a lot like bigger and fancier like than it actually is. Like I think people think like the nightlife is unbelievable and you're going VIP everywhere you go. Like people don't understand that like a lot of these junior players are barely old enough to go to the bar, right? You only yeah. get 19 and 20 year olds. And if you're lucky, excuse me, if you're lucky, your 17 and 18 year olds are getting in. Yeah. But I'm not even really talking as far as a bar. Like we we had a, a sick uh sponsorship with fire rock and it was this nasty golf course like sick golf course i hate that i didn't golf yet yeah we would always go hit that on like our off days kind of thing but like the life in general like the big city the traffic thing kind of sucked because everyone's disperted a little bit the like traffic's it. tough there. it is it's shit Turned people down drive down like idiots. One ways and stuff. yeah they all drive like stupid idiots yeah like, i hate it but I mean, if you're not driving, you don't got to worry. You just get picked up and go on your phone, <laughs> which was me for a couple of years. And I was like, screw this. I got to get my car. But yeah. it was it was good. Like, you go downtown and, like, we had our spots, right? It's tough with the OHL. And I'm sure a lot of OHL guys would say this, too. Like, you can't even go out on a Saturday because your weekends go from you're yeah. playing Friday, Saturday, or you're playing Friday, Sunday, or you're playing Saturday, Sunday. Or you're playing all, or three. You're playing all three and three. Yeah. Like, you get screwed to go out. I mean, the nights that you can get out, it's worth it. But, like, you – in London, we would just go hit up like a Molly Blooms and go sing karaoke with 
15 dumb asses and just yeah. go, go get drunk and have a good time and celebrate the weekend and be yeah. happy that we're done in a way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so how about like, how, how long did it take you in the OHL to get the reputation of a tough guy? Like that you're, you know, you'll fight anyone. Like when, when did you start getting that respect, uh, I guess, in the league? Uh, I'd probably say like my 18 year old year, like my 17 year old year when I had that like knockout, I think like, but it wasn't against like, it was against Tyler Nether. I don't think like he was looked at as a big tough guy in the league. But being that nobody kind of knew who I was and like the style of my play, I think they started to see like all oh, this kids vicious. Not yeah, like, was, you're not at his career. Or something. Yeah, that like yeah, so that's my. I'm pretty like certain it's a speculation because I'm pretty sure that was either like fourth or fifth concussion that he had, oh, and, which was not good. I feel bad oh, for the kid. Yeah, it's tough. It was terrible. But I'm pretty sure like that. Yeah, like that might have like kind of sealed the hatch for him. I would have, if I had four concussions too, I wouldn't want to continue to sport yeah. either. But yeah, I kind of, kind of did it. But after that, like I, I had two other fights because you're only around allowed three fights, right? So it was kind of tough to actually be a tough guy when you're allowed three fights. So yeah. I think after that year, guys seen my style of play and knew like I was a nuisance kind of thing. Yeah. They didn't really look at me as like a tough guy because I didn't really fight anybody worthy to be called a tough guy. And then when I got in my 18 year old year, when I fought uh, Giovanni, like I fought, I fought. Uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, what was the coach of Barry's? Why can't I think of his name? Uh, Howard Chuck? Yeah, like his yeah. son. I remember I fought ben his son. And, but like, he wasn't no big kid either. Like He was just an yeah. average size hockey player. He was a little prick too. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. me. So I remember we got into it and I was like, that doesn't make me be a tough guy. But when I fought, I think when I fought Giovanni. And I, Giovanni Smith? Smith? Yeah, yeah. When I fought Giovanni. Giovanni Smith, top, top yeah. customer. Big boy. Big yeah. boy. It's scary too because we played him. Uh, there's a little backstory of that fight. This one, uh, this one always like kind of gives me shivers because I was terrified. Like, I hope he's not listening either. I don't want to give him the, I don't want to give him the props because I did, I did well, I did well. But yeah, it was we. He so we just got traded, right? Just got traded to Kitchener, and our next month, I think it was our next month and a half, we played Kitchener like eight times. Don't know why the schedule just lined up that way. They're in our conference, right? So yeah, played them eight times through like a month and a half. Might have been like six times, but regardless. I remember like our first game. I don't even know. I think I think I hit him when he was on Guelph that same season. Like I hit him in the bud. He caught a sewer pass. I smoked him. And he like got up, didn't do anything. I'm like, oh sick. So I skate away, change. And then fast forward time, a couple months later, he's on Kitchener. And then I see him again. And then he he actually Cole Sherwood, who used to play on London with me, who was yeah. then on Kitchener. He, he DM me before the game. He goes, "Hey, G wants it." And I'm like, "No way!" So like you know when you're on the bus, you're staging you're, one. Yeah, he's staging. Yeah. He like. Cole did that with another fight. I forget what guy did that with me, but he he snapped, he, he DMs you on Instagram. Cole's broker and yeah, like, no, no, no. he goes G wants it. So I'm like, oh boys, and I show all the boys. I'm like, should I fight G tonight? Like it's kind of a big fight. Like I can't just go in this like blind and confident. Yeah, like, I should probably like think about this a little bit. Yeah, and we played them six more times. So I didn't do with that game. Second game, we we go along, nothing, whatever. And then third, are you game, guys like chirping at each other? Yeah, we are, we are. But that's yeah. where it gets good. Is the third game. I'm we're at the bun, and I'm right on the red line, stretching, being a dick, just looking over. Like they have sick players. They got Aiden Brown, Masker, and like they got they they loaded up. Yeah, we were doing really well against them. those first three games. I think we were one and two, and like all three, way expected closer games yeah. than they thought. And uh, we, I'm sitting there on the red line. I'm looking over at him, and he comes by. And he goes, "Hey, you want it tonight?" I'm like, sure. Just let me know. He skates, skates all the way around, comes back to the red line, and he goes, he didn't really, like, play that well over the three games we played, and he looks yeah. at me and goes, ah, he's like, I should probably get a point first, like, Det- something about Detroit. I was, yeah. like, I was like, sure. I was like, just fucking let me know. Just let me know. Yeah. Had to shake it. Like, let me know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then whatever, he skates away. The best part, this is a, this, this was when I fought him. I think it was, like, we still played him two times after this when I fought him. I knew it was coming for, like, three games. Just really going to bed at night, like, oh, is this the game I'm gonna fight? Him? Is this the game I'm gonna fight him? <laughs> yeah. So the third game, whenever he hits me, he goes, oh, I gotta get a point first. So be it. This guy gets a breakaway pass first, first shift. He goes down and absolutely undresses him, scores. Um, he skates by our bench, and I go, so now, now, G doesn't really hear me, but yeah, he skates away, and then two shifts go by, and we weren't matched up against each other. I was matched up against like Maskrin's line and he was on the second line and I see him look at Maskrin and I like because the benches are right here right yeah and I see I see Maskrin and G do a little swap and I'm like Dale I like I knew Dale would let me go if because I saved up my fights and Dale would grant me my fight if I wanted if I needed to hop on yeah so I see G go and I like we kind of gave each other a little nod and jumped on the ice and seeing the offside like it was an offside circle we were going to skate to the draw and then 
I see Woody and I was like, does he want it? Thinking I have to ask him because he's set up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going through the, the messenger. And then I see G right after, like I go like this. He's like, you want it? And then I see G, I'm like, yeah. And then this is like when they're going to set up to go drop, right? So we just go. Oh, man. Them. It was a good fight. Like, I'm pretty sure they took all my fights off of hockey fights. So I don't even know if you can go see it. <laughs> I, I want to find this. I have it. I have it on my phone. But, like, it's it's a, it's a solid fight. We, we kind of, like, grabbed him. He kind of, like, fell over on the first grab. Like, I don't know. He just lost his footing. And I tried to go in a little bit. Didn't really connect. But he, like, fell over again. He, but I don't know why he kept falling over. I looked good while he kept falling over. But And then I came under with, like, one or two, but it wasn't anything. Did you, so but, did you win that fight? I don't know. Like the, the announcers definitely made it sound like I did. I I will admit that I didn't see belt at the end. Like I did give him a big old hug and kind of just went with the fall. But at yeah. that point, man, like I didn't have anything left. I was just yeah. happy that I got my somewhat of licks in. I knew I didn't really hit him, but in, in a fan's perspective, I might have won the fight. There you <laughs> go. You're gonna have to send me that video. We I will. Make I will. a clip and, and get that one out there. But yeah, I'm down. I'm down. That's uh, I had to save all my throw my OHL career because they just keep taking them down. There actually was a sick video when I knocked out another of a fan who video on YouTube, like on YouTube, he posted it. And it was the funniest reaction because it was in Windsor, right? So it was a, it was a reaction. But yeah. Yeah, this guy's like, get him, kick his ass, kick his ass. And then I hit, I hit him with the knockout punch. And they just go, oh. <laughs> but it was like hundreds of them around. I'm like, oh. It was the best video ever. They, he took it down too. Oh, man. I, I might oh. have seen that video because I remember. So I remember before I even like met you, I guess, well, no, like early in like last season, like the year before this year, I guess, when we were just getting to know each other, someone on the team, I can't remember, like it might have been Bracker, was just like, yeah, this Timken guy is like the toughest guy in the O. Like he ended someone's career. Like, I was like, really, Tim? Like he's so nice. Like, I don't know how I didn't know this, right? Like, and uh, he's like, look at this video. And he shows me the video of probably the one you're talking yeah. about. And you knocked out another. And yeah, it was like, oh, this guy's an absolute weapon. Like, pretty scary. It's a pretty scary video. <laughs> yeah, but, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's, it's, sorry, to cut you off. But yeah, no, you're it's, good. it's crazy, like the persona you can get in that league, though. Cause like you could, you could literally not fight for three years if you wanted. And the, like, the amount of tough, tough guys, so on, so that, like, are considered to be fighters and all that stuff. Like you don't, you don't have to be tough in the OHL anymore to be tough. You just have to yeah. like walk around like you're yeah. tough and like go into scrums and be like, yeah, and like be like the biggest, <laughs> biggest guy. That's all you gotta do is have almost fake confidence. Like I, I'll, I'll back it up if it really gets down to it. But half the time you go in and you just pretend like you're the guy, and usually everyone will believe that you're the guy. Yeah. yeah. Like I remember going to do a scrum with the Kiel Toss one time, and I didn't. It wasn't even like going into a scrum. I was just like kind of going to help somebody out and he was going to grab me he's like oh i don't want nothing to do with you big guy i'm like i where the hell do you even get this from like, i like you akil like i like you. i'm not gonna like i just don't know where they get this big like i get it but like if you've seen it proud actually but... <laughs> oh i think it's awesome man so even i, I want to talk about the dallas stars camp so you, you got invited to the, to the stars camp and can you just talk about that and how it was for you and even just like going to an nhl camp as a guy from rainy river like all that yeah no it was almost like unbelievable i didn't really expect it whatsoever just based on the season right was this the year you had the 50 no not year? even close really like, i didn't get nothing after that bro that's what i'm saying oh. this is where it gets weird as hell so after my first season right where my rookie season i was so uncomfortable had eight points 45 games played i had like i don't know like 90 penalty minutes so or just being a dickhead yeah but i didn't have really any talks with any nhl team going into it and i actually had my s trip booked s trip booked with my old high school i was so pumped to go to Cuba. And I was like, yeah, let's go. Sick. Like I had no plans this summer. And then I get a call from my dad, like, hey buddy, your agent just called. Like, you're you're gonna go to Dallas. Like you got an invite to their uh like to their camp. And I'm like, oh kind of sick. Like, when is it? It's during S trip. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I was pumped though. Like I was still like, what? Yeah. I just didn't even feel real. I'm like, I didn't even feel like worthy, I guess, in a way. Cause yeah. I'm like, like, I'm sure the guys that I'm going with are like disgusting and nasty and like i just didn't think that highly of myself after the season i had because i knew i was capable of more i just wasn't where i needed to be but yeah so going going to the camp like i oh, the summer was like hard because i remember i was like i was trying to say i remember i was trying to quit smoking weed and i was having like a tough time and like i was just like I knew what was in front of me and all that stuff. And I was just like, oh shit, like I really got to bear down. And I did. I went to like the summer camp in Minnesota. I went away for a week. Like it was like no phones, all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm going to Dallas Stars camp. Like, what the hell? But when I went there, it was unbelievable. Like I remember Jason Robertson, like he was in my draft year. And like we kind of gravitated towards each other because like the OHL guys 
kind of thing, right? Like you know each other. Yeah. And he was only a second round pick, right? You know, it's like who is this like kind of not not chubby kid, but like who is this like long haired like I don't know, it doesn't look very athletic kid. Yeah. Second round pick, like, I knew who he was. I was just like, this kid's good at hockey, like he's a pillow. And you look at him, and you look at him now, and he's breaking records. One of the best the players in the entire NHL, years, which is crazy. It's insane. Yeah. He just broke the Stars record, like hundred point he's, guy. Like, it's nuts. He's good. He's a good buddies with Bernie. Not good buddies with Bernie. Bernie also. Yeah, I mean they played in Kingston together yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But like, yeah, you show up there, and it's just I don't know. It's Dallas, Texas, too, right? You're in the hottest place in the world, and we. I remember we got to go to we got to go to a uh, Top Golf, and I swear to God, they gave us this. I uh, membership that was like lifetime to top golf. I swear it was like some top golf. I don't know. I swear it said lifetime. You lost I it. Lost it. Oh my god, Tim. <laughs> I lost it like a month, but I didn't even golf yet, so I didn't care. Yeah. But, no, you're kicking yourself yeah, no, sure. but like the hotels we stayed at, because I I wish I could because I went to Traverse City, right? Like you know, Traverse, yeah. like that little mini cam tournament. tournament. So they took me there. I don't know what had them think that I was good enough for main cap. So you played games, sorry, in that tournament? Yeah, I played all Traverse City. And I got scratched the first game. I didn't fight. I should have fought. Because Sean Allen was there, and I always wanted yeah. to fight Sean Allen. But he was one of those guys, too, that was, like, bigger than me and shit, where I, like, yeah. kind of second thought. I wasn't that, like, I wasn't not against He's still fight. them fighting he is. He's in the coast. He's a freak man. in the coast. He's a freak. Yeah. Like, that was always one. post every time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, like, I, like, I mean, I'm like, we're, we're friends on Snapchat and shit. Like, I, yeah. He actually asked me, uh, when it was COVID year Brock, if I would like come and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, because he, I asked him, I was like, did you just like, how'd you get there? And he's like, I just asked you, like, I don't need to have an agent. I just kind of reached out yeah. and I said, sure. He, he listens to this. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. He's a great yeah. guy. I like Sean a lot. He had, yeah. yeah. He was a scary fucker. And <laughs> oh, yeah. like, guys looked at him like, at that. but he had some like big boy fights. I didn't have any big boy fights like that. Like Dude, those are, like, yeah. Like I know, but he had like some six, four, like I remember, I'm pretty sure he fought Douglas. Uh, oh, yeah. Eerie, and that was like a. I'm pretty sure he did when Douglas was younger, but he had some scary fights. Yeah, but uh, yeah, like getting back to Dallas, like the hotels were unbelievable. Funny, funny little side story. Me being a little shit, <laughs> I was 17, like 17, right, going to Dallas, and we were at this sick hotel. This was while we were at Main Cap. One of the last days there, we're sitting by the pool at the hotel, and I was like, like I, I had a fake ID. Because, like I said, like I lived on the border back home. And when I played my 16 year old year, I got this fake that said I was from Ohio. Said I was 23 years old. Oh, man. So that's a stretch. So I don't know what 17 year old would go to a gas station and think it's okay while you're at a hockey camp with, with an NHL team. I go to this gas station and buy a case of natural light, natty lights, <laughs> bring it over. Because we had the day off the next day, too, right? Yeah. But I remember I brought it over and it was like Zach Roberts. Like, you know, Zach Roberts yeah. plays on Globe. He was at the camp too with me and J Rob and uh, Shaw Boomhauer. He's in the coast now too. Yeah. But all four of us always were together and <laughs> we can't grab these beers. I'm like, come on, boys, dig in. Like, let's have a couple beers. Like, I can't believe I just got it. Got it with this fake. Not one of those guys had a beer with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting there, we're watching South Park. I'm just guzzling this. <laughs> I can't believe you, Timmer. I know, but like, I, I also took it, took it as like, I'm in Dallas. <laughs> and if I do get my card denied, who the hell cares? I'm just gonna, like, I'm not going to jail. I'm just going to snip my yeah, fake. Yeah. And then if I do get it, I'm in Dallas with the stars and I got beer and I'm 17. You're an old time hockey player, man. You should have lived like 20 I years. Do it. I'm the NHL. You, I would have grew up in the not even grew up in the 90s, but played hockey throughout my 90s. I'd be in the NHL. Maybe not now, yeah. but throughout, like, I could have been a Brandon Prust. I'm telling yeah. you, Brandon Prust skated with us in London. He was, yeah, I love Prest. Yeah, I'm not going to talk bad about him, but like, I remember he brought me and Billy out to center ice one time at the start of uh, my 19 year old season. And he was like trying to be like our whatever player coach kind of thing. And we dropped the gloves just for shits. Like, we didn't really punch. We just kind of got to grab each other. And when I grabbed him, I gave him a shrug forward and he literally his feet went underneath him. I was like, right on top. He's like, oh, he's like, you're a pretty strong kid. And I'm like, hello. Did you make it as a tough guy in the NHL? Like, I get it. Like, he was a really strategic fighter and like knew what he was doing and shit. But I was just like, if I, I swear, if I was Presty's age and grew up in the same era and had the same chances, and I would have been like a Paul or Andrew Shaw kind of thing. Yeah, I could, I could get some skill too if I had some confidence. And who knows? And like, if I had the right people in front of me and like made some better decisions, probably would work out better. But you know what I mean? Like, I just think if even even if I rewinded three years before I actually started in the OHL when there was a 10 fight rule, I think I would have like fought my way to yeah. at least make my way to get the, to the, a, a, the yeah. a and then whatever, go for it. If I make an AHL career, it'd be sick. That'd be nasty. Yeah. I mean, that's still a goal. Hopefully. Well, I was going to say like, you're, 
you talk about having no skill, all this stuff, but at the end of the day, you're coming off an unbelievable season. And keep in mind, you're, you're a 50 point guy one year in the O, like, and now you're playing on the on the top line with Jacob Roach, OUA MVP. Um, your career is very much on the upswing, and in the form of like not a, I don't want to say necessarily a skill guy, but you're getting points. Like you're you're an offensive contributor, and you're top like you're a power forward. So what do you think of your game now, like where it's heading, and, and just like talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I I I want to like end up like I feel like I get a lot of chances where I could end up scoring more than I should, like more than I'm not. In a way, like coming on two on ones and like overthinking, I'm always thinking like I'm a pass first guy when I do get offensive situations. Or if I just shoot the puck, you see puck go in more more or not than you make in the pass. But I don't know. I I I do know I have the skill and stuff, but I consistency was kind of tough for me this season. As far as like I have a really good game and then I would have a very like average or below average kind of game. But I do I do know like I have the skill and like I can make the plays and see it. It's just a matter of me actually knowing I can do it. And mm-hmm. like, not like sometimes I do get too into like the physical aspect and you can see where I chirp and chirp and chirp and I don't shut up and it takes away from me actually playing the game. But yeah, I don't know in the end, like I, I, that's why, that's not why I play the game is to chirp and be like that. But <laughs> that, that is a big part, not a big part, but like well, that's, that's that, feed, that feeds into my role. Yeah, and... exactly. That feeds into like why I started playing hockey because I like to be like, yeah. not the tough guy but I like to be like an aggressor and like win for my team and like be the guy that's so like you piss ma- people off yeah. and you want them to draw a penalty and exactly. there, there is a role for that exactly it's just tough in the CIS you can't really do yeah. it like it's it's very like it's a very very unique skill in this league that you have to have and like I don't I haven't mastered it by any means I've drew a couple penalties where I'm like yeah there we go but then I've took some stupid ones where I'm like or just even my chirping and shit right like I remember that Ryerson game on the road this year where we kind of like lost our heads as oh, a team. Yeah. It wasn't just you, I, but I mean, it no, was, I did too. I you, scored two goals, and I was like, I, I yeah, there was stop. a lot. It was that was like the heaviest chirping game. I yeah, remember, man. that was like, bad. <laughs> that was like the first one that TJ saw too, where he was like, "Holy shit, this team is psycho." <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't help like the years that we had before too, where we didn't have anyone telling us to shut the hell up, right? Like, you know, like we just kind of did what we wanted and went from there yeah but i mean so next year for you you know you're shaping up a, a as a leader a top line player on the badgers like as you get into your third year playing on this team and um you know potential pro opportunities after that so like how do you prepare like what's your mindset honestly like going into next year like how do you feel going into next year i feel i feel comfortable i'm really excited with like our leadership group and all that and i don't know I, I'm I, I'm gonna be more comfortable. Like I was really comfortable last year too, but I, I really like our our new leadership group and the new guys that we're we're gonna have coming in and stuff. But like I I don't know. I just feel I feel a lot more like comfortable knowing that like I'm really gonna have like a I don't I gotta earn it obviously, right? And yeah. hopefully TJ trusts me enough to to play the minutes that he's gonna give me. But I don't know. I'm gonna work hard this summer and hopefully put it put myself in a good position to play some top minutes and contribute because I want to have a season that like I have two more years that I'm eligible for and I do I do want to play two but if this season goes well enough where I think like I could go to Europe the next season I I think I might try to play like a half season and then see if I go to the coast and then go to Europe kind of thing Mm -hmm. but that all depends on what Europe teams are looking at me right it's not easy being an import yeah and playing the best you can, right? Like, guys play full five seasons. Like, Sapula, he just went across, and he played five really good seasons. Yeah. And now he sees, like, he's doing really well and stuff. But, like, yeah, it's not easy for for everyone just to go and do that. You yeah. to get some hookups, and hopefully it all works out. But, no, no, I'm excited for the position I'm coming into, and, and I think our team can have, like, a really good, really good season. Yeah, we're looking good. And and we talked about Rochi a couple times. Friend of the show and friend of Ethan Cardwell, my co-host, obviously. Roommate, too. Your roommate. And OUA MVP last year. You're playing on his line. What's Rochi mean to you? He's a beauty. Like, it was, it, it, it was, it was a little tough, I guess. I would say, like, uh, I guess the start of, like, the original season. When he first came in, because like him and Bernie were like getting the last two spots, right? And I kind of got snubbed, not snubbed out. I just kind of the way it worked. I didn't come in the best shape. And I, I great guy, love him. He's funny as hell. <laughs> and we get along well. And we're, we're really good buddies. And it's cool to see him progress and like go into that leadership 
kind of role and mm-hmm. see him see him do well and credit to him for the season he had. It was unbelievable. But I would honestly, it was when when me him and Bernie did play together and we were playing really well. The Lampman line, the Lampman line. It was honestly, it was just like playing with formal in a way. Because when uh, I was in London, my second year, when we traded away Max Jones and all those guys, right? We did a rebuild, and it was me, Tyler. When Rolo came for his one season in London, it was me, Rolo, and Formal. And it was all like Roshi's a centerman, right? And Formal, Formal was a winger, and Rolo was center, but Formal was pretty much playing center because he was slashing across so much. Yeah. And honestly, that's all you really had to do with Rochi. Pop you up with it? Oh, I'd love it. Love, love one more. Yeah. Thank you so much. Fresh one. I'm okay for me just because I got to drive. So really like for this. I got my yeah, picking okay. me up. There you go. You played ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, she always picking me up. Right? Yeah. But yeah, like I don't know. Rochi's just easy to play because he's smart. Sometimes he's hard to predict because he's so good that you don't know if he's gonna hold on to the puck. And he, it's just like Bernie too. Like you want to go help him in the corner, but like you don't know if he's gonna come out with the puck and you're gonna like leave a good position you're in. But they're they're two really good players to feed off of. And if you're all on the same page, then it's only you're only gonna get success from there. Yeah, for sure. And so I mean, we'll kind of wrap it up with a, a couple personality questions. If you haven't gotten to know Timmer yet, maybe you'll get to know him a little little better here, and then we can kind of. Get, get going, but um, we talked so much about London. If you were stranded on an island for a month with three other members of the London Knights who you played with, who would you want them to be and why? Uh, Bill Bill, Billy Moskal, because Billy uh, Billy would know how to survive. Billy's one of the smartest guys in the world, I'm telling you. And he, he goes to U of T. He's, he's, he just did an economics uh, exam. He's got a financing exam tomorrow. He's got a stats exam. Not even just that, just wilderness, Billy, for sure. He's one of my best. Well, he's a northern boy too. He is. He's Sudbury, Sudbury. So he knows how to live. Uh, I'd say Coisey, Jordan Coy. Oh yeah, goalie, really good buddy to this day too. Just because that's who me and Billy would gang up. (laughs) And Coisey takes in the right way. So is he still playing? Yeah, Coisey. Coisey was in. uh, He's in Saskatchewan, like University of Saskatchewan. Oh, okay. It was when Babcock was there. That's how he initially went because Babcock and Mark Hunter were talking a lot when we were all playing. I think that's kind of how he got his connection. And then Babcock left. But Koizy just because it's Koizy. Well, I remember with Koi, sorry, like, um, to cut you off, but when I was I, that year, I guess he was on London. I was I was working for Barry uh, with the Colts, and we had the, the Canada-Russia game was in London, and he was in net, and he played that night, I guess, and then, or no, no, he had just gotten traded the day before out of London, and then he came back to London to play in, yeah, that, in yeah. that game, and, it, and, and I think Dale was the coach. It was just funny. Like, they just dealt this guy, and he just comes right back, and he's in that because they already named the team before. Yeah. Like, so it was funny. I just remember that storyline. Cutthroat, like, cutthroat business. Yeah, it's business. crazy how it happens. But, yeah, go go ahead. So, yeah, Coy just for that. And then probably I'd say Coy yeah. just because it's Cliff and yeah. make everything somewhat entertaining. And I don't know. We'd probably have some fun on that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, you love that guy, Cliff Boo, for those who don't know, who was, what, second-round pick? Yeah, he's 69th. 69th um, overall. Buffalo? Was yeah. It? Out of this crazy draft, too, like a pretty sick yeah. 90, 98 draft. And now he's in the KHL. Yeah. He and he got, was buzzing around at all of our games last he was, year. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah. But, yeah, he had a little kind of – like, didn't – just didn't really – didn't really get along with all the coaches he had throughout his career and stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, he's still doing pretty damn well in the KHL. So, yeah. it's not a bad Is he making good money there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I think he said he was making, like, 500. Oh, yeah. yeah pretty stupid. I mean, yeah. you go from being a second-round pick in the NHL to the KHL. Oh, he played a, a couple years in the A. Yeah, right? yeah, he played, like, a good amount in the A. He was with Cleveland for a good bit. He played with uh, William Lahead, too, that played in Niagara. Yeah. Willie's a good Willie's a good buddy, too. I, I actually almost golfed with him today, but I told him. Oh, is he buzzing around here? Yeah, Will's – I'm pretty sure Will quit, like, hockey. Yeah, he's not sure. playing. Yeah, I, I think he's just doing – I don't even know if he's doing school if he's just working yeah. now. But. Well, I remember he – we had played it like in his OA year, he wanted to go to London. Yeah. And so he was like, no, I'm not reporting. I'm going to play for Western University yeah, so that he can get his trade. And I remember we played his one OUA game. And like it was Brock. We went there. Was he a freak? Uh, he was pretty average. That well, did he like try to nail anyone or anything? Uh, I think nothing. he was just like, whatever. I don't oh, think he really, wanted to be there that bad. Yeah. And then the next day he's signing with London or whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. I remember he did. Like I played with him for a season. I actually fought him for, that was actually one of the, like that was kind of a big fight I had too in my yeah. London Knights too was when he was on Niagara. But yeah, we fought and then I don't know if it was the same season or the next season. But then he came. I was like, oh Willie. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So uh moving on. Um I'll never admit that I beat him though. <laughs> I did. I swear I beat him. I told him I was like, 
I was like, I was up here and I was hitting you. I was like, if you were down here, hit me in the chest, but he'll never admit it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so this is a kind of a staple sort of that we've been asking our guests lately, but how do you eat a cupcake? I go top first. I honestly don't even really eat the bottom. I mean, I will go if it depends on the mood I'm in. I'll I'll go straight, but like usually I'll just rip that top off. I'll eat the top, but you just chuck the bottom. I, dude, I get so bad of heartburn that oh, like, yeah. I don't even eat cupcakes. And if I do and I eat the top, it's terrible. But like the heartburn's terrible. Cupcakes good, but yeah, top, <laughs> top first for sure. Okay. Uh, how would your teammates describe you? <laughs> I'd say the one word, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, Half of them would probably say an idiot. <laughs> um, uh, the other half, I don't even know what they would say, honestly. How would you describe your ass? You know what? So, like, I'll, I'll give you some credit here. And and don't get me wrong, an idiot comes to mind. Yeah, but, but you've yeah. grown, like, and matured a lot, like, in the two years that I've gotten to know you now. And, you know, you've become a leader on our team. And, uh, you know, for one, I would I would, I would would say leader. Um you like to keep things light. Like you're a big keep it light guy yeah, joking true. around the room. Um, so I think you bring that element. And then I think guys would just describe you as like funny, maybe a little crazy. Like outgoing, I'd say. Definitely yeah. outgoing, loud. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, man. I mean, I, I, I'd i say that's how I would describe you. Yeah, I think outgoing is always how like people kind of put me out to be. And like I like to be outgoing, but I, I don't like to be like so stern about things and like take everything so – like aggressive if we're losing and like snap on guys like it's so yeah. it's so useless to just snap on a guy for a play he obviously didn't mean to make or like you do something stupid in the room like just chirp him you know you gotta actually get mad at the guy like, yeah you know i just hate when guys actually think like i just hate any confrontation really i'm not a very confrontational person Says the fighter <laughs> i know but like that's how it is for most guys like they know they're so confrontational on the ice because it just stays on the ice and then you see him after the game and you can go talk where it goes, goes spew some shit and you're fine. But like even Gruel, like, you know, Daylon Gruel yeah. played against him on a one sound and he's good buddies with Justin Kyle who's on our team. And he's been on our last like five parties and every single party he comes up with we're both spew into each other. And he's like, ah, you remember when you fucking hated me want to chop my head off? He's like, Look yeah. at us now. I'll give you a big dab. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. I love your brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's uh. He, he's a good guy. He was a tough guy. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with him. I don't want to speak too much here. We both kind of know, but he might be good. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to say it on the podcast, but he would never fight me either. Well, he would never fight me. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the size advantage on him. Right? Girls, yeah. Girls, yeah, like I wouldn't like want to fight, but I fought way less tougher guys than him. But he was like one of those just scary tough guys. Where, yeah. Like, I think he would just see red and not control Yeah. It. And you could see it in his eyes. Yeah. Too. He has that missing tooth. He'd snarl. Yeah. He, a bit. he just w wouldn't care. Like he'll, he'll just, he wants to kill you. Yeah. Right? And he, and he would attempt to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. interesting, man. Um, if you couldn't be a hockey player, any athlete at all, no golf, no anything, what would you want to do? Oh, I'm actually really like curious about this. Um, great question. Yeah, I would say golf. <laughs> I know. I, that's why I um, said no golf either. Like, and, I, and I kind of figured you might not have an answer. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's really outside of sports. I would love to, like, coach in a way. But I don't know. Like, I would like to coach high-level hockey. But I also, like, believe it or not, I feel like I am really good with kids. <laughs> and, like, I always kind of have been just, like, with the spirit I kind of have. Just trying to be fun. Yeah. And, like, going. like a big kid. Yeah. I've so, seen like, you with kids. Yeah. Like, we had those kids in Windsor. Uh, warm up with us and yeah. stuff like i saw you yeah you were rolling around the floor like <laughs> yeah they're, they're like I, I like kids and stuff so i think if i did something even in like physical education even though like i'm i mean that wouldn't be a bad career either but i just i i don't i honestly don't know what i would want to do but i think if it was involved with something with like i don't know something physical obviously like as far as like maybe like a i don't know gym teacher or something like that yeah or like even like a hockey instructor but like I would like to coach high level hockey too, I guess, in a way, but yeah, I don't know, some sort of coaching, I'd say, just to, or, or even I actually do really like, I think like sales too. I, I worked at a shop. I won't say what specific shop in a store, but I was one of the best sales reps yeah. in the store. And like, I just very personal. Like, I'm not, I wouldn't like overstep my boundary being like a retail guy. I just 
know, I just like selling stuff too because it feels yeah. like a little accomplishment if you complete the sale. You can be a good sales. I feel like yeah. you can get into insurance or something. To make yeah, little- honestly, I think honestly, yeah. my dream job would be able to be like a real estate agent. Oh yeah, just to like be in that vibe and showing off sick houses yeah. and being like good, I don't know, personable yeah. guy. Yeah, chew all to- your teeth then. So yeah, you know, I've been good. Yeah. But chewing, but like I've, I think I can't <laughs> believe I've got I've got this one chipped before, but like like this way, not like this way. Okay. So it's like I don't know, odd. I chipped on a hash brown though. It wasn't even in hockey. Oh, did it did it, did it at Masterson when I was living with Bernie and Hughesy and Roach. Really? Yeah, and then I got it. I got it fixed through Brock. But okay. How the hell do I we had a it? lot of like chipped and knocked out teeth this year. I know. Like, like, any other Mitzi year. too. Like yeah, shit show with injuries. Yeah. I mean, anyway, Timmer, this, this was awesome. This was a great interview. I'm really excited we got this one out there. I think the listeners are going to love it. Hell yeah, it was a long time coming. Yeah, I definitely want to do it. So, yeah, thanks for doing this. And, yeah, uh, yeah appreciate it. All right, I want to thank Cole Timken for that. Super cool to get to do that one with him and in the style we did. Um, yeah, just really happy to to get that one out there. But some golf stuff. First of all, I mean – before the interview, we were talking a bit about the Florida Panthers. Brooks Kepka shows up at the Panthers game with his trophy, drinking with Brady Kachuk and in the Panthers jersey. But what do you think of the the weekend in the golf world? The, the guy's awesome, man. Like, obviously, he, he was coming into form for a while there, big showing at the Masters. And then, obviously, um, he also won on live before that, and he's had some tough finishes. So, to kind of see him take the world by storm again and get back in the public eye is like, okay, this guy's like a really legit golfer. We can't forget about him. And he's, he's saying he's finally healthy. So I think we're going to see a lot of damage from Brooks Kepko over the next few years. And I'm excited about it because he's a great player to watch. Yeah. He looks really good, man. And um, what else? There, I Did you see how like slim Bryson DeChambeau looked? Yeah, that was crazy. Like strong, like, like skinny, man. <laughs> He's went through so many body transformations over the past few years, but obviously he's playing good golf, top five there. And I think mm-hmm. like a lot of people are starting to kind of stop this and live in a way and just saying like, okay, like it, it was their decision. Like they're still coming over here and they're still competing at a high level. So, yeah, I mean, I think when everyone started going to live and there was all this panic, everyone thought we were never going to see these guys again, but they're always back. So like it doesn't, Really yeah, as, as long as they keep playing well in these majors, um, winning them, obviously getting their exemptions back in and stuff like that, um, it's going to be awesome to keep seeing them play. And even though they're like maybe on, and, and that's the thing too, like you never know the ratings on Live, and it could be becoming more broadcasted, Golf Channel stuff like that. So people will see these guys, and they'll see them quite frequently, I think, as time goes on. But um, obviously, a big showing from him, and I thought. That's why I, I took a live guy, obviously, in Dustin to make that uh, pick. I think they're well rested coming in and stuff like that too. So there's a ton of arguments, but yeah, I love seeing Kepka at the game. Just like the night after, you can tell he was pretty hammered, but yeah. he was just enjoying himself, and he has all the right in the world to be right there. Yeah, he can do whatever he wants. He just wanted. Um, like last thing, I kind of want to say on golf, unless you have any more. But what about like this Michael Block? I'm sure you've heard about this story, right? Crazy. So, I don't know. I guess. Do you want to give a quick, quick rundown for the listeners who might not, and then we can we can talk about it. Yeah. So the PGA Championship is ran by the PGA of America, which is like it's not the PGA Tour. It's a different thing. So it's like all the, like literally professional golf association, um, of America. So, um, all of these pros. There's like twenty nine thousand club pros that who are the head pro at clubs that you would just go to and they would talk to you about running their tournaments or getting a lesson or something like that. And he obviously Michael Block is one of those people who got into the tournament by winning one of the uh, events that's ran for a select few of those twenty nine thousand to get into the tournament. And then from there he ran with it. He ended up with a top fifteen um, finish. Uh, which is unseen before in in years anyway. Um, and he made a hole-in-one playing with Rory on the final day on hole 15. And he ended up shooting even, even, even one over for a total of one over and a tie for 15th and a crazy up and down on 18 too to secure himself in for next year. And he earns ex- exemptions into the Charles Schwab, which is this week. And he'll be coming to Canada yeah. where most of our listeners can go see him at the Canadian Open. And I know... 
I'm always at the Canadian. So I'm actually excited to go watch him play there. But let's get your thoughts on it after I just gave a whole spiel about him. Well, that was perfect. That's what we needed. You can say it better than I can. So um, what was cool was that the hole in one is what I call a plunker. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> he plunked it. It went straight in the hole. It wasn't like one that rolled in. It landed in the hole, man. I've never seen anything like that. I call that a dunk. Yeah, it's a dunk. That's probably the more standard term. But so yeah. I saw like this one tweet. This guy said, if that ever happens, like that should count as a zero on the scorecard, which I, I agree. That would actually be hilarious. Yeah, I mean, that that might never get repeated. And even the times it does just plunk in like that, like it usually will bounce out. Um, no, so. I know exactly. It's it's actually crazy to think about that happening and like the percentages and stuff like that. And then alone, let alone on a Sunday in one of the final groups at a major paired with Rory too for the guy, like incredible feel good story. Yeah. And I don't know. I saw like his tournament winnings last year or something or in the last like six years were like three grand. And this year it's 260 grand. Yeah. Nuts. And he's going to go obviously make some, hopefully make some more money as long as he can make the cut it. Um, maybe one or two of these next few tournaments that he's going to and good for him. Um, you mean like you think about like storylines and stuff coming in and next thing you know, it's a club pro in the mix at a PGA championship. So that was incredible to watch. And I'm, I'm just happy for him and maybe one day we get him on the pod and hear his side of the story. Yeah. We'll get a collab episode with him and Will Zalatoris. That would be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. um, Yeah. I mean, that's kind of all, all I got. So if you got anything, go for it or wrap it up. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited. I'm kind of, I think we're getting close to getting me back in here, back in the mix on the interviews too. So I'm looking forward to getting back into him obviously we had to do it this way so rasky could keep keep us buzzing during my playoffs and i could stay dialed on the hockey and he took care of all the business so that's how we're still getting these bangers out to you so quickly every week now and um yeah with that being said i'm pumped i know rask is pumped we're all excited and i hope you guys are too and we really appreciate the support and we'll see you next time